to my channel. Hey yo, hey yo, listen up, listen up, yeah. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. The wireless woman. You in charge of the girls, right? I am in charge of the girls. Are you in charge of the girls? I am in charge of the girls. Okay. Right. Hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. Welcome back, wi fis to yet another underground transmission of the wireless woman. Go ahead and do me a favor on your way in and like this video. Why? Because when you like my videos, well, I love it. Also, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel. <laughs> And click the notification bell for notifications of when I upload new content and when I go live there. Like this live schedule is filling up and I love it. It's like a vacation for my own content because I get to <laughs> have guests on. Like, you know how you act a little bit different when you get a guest in your house. So, yeah, but I'm back on my bullshit. Back to my ratchety ratchetness because I'm here making content by myself. Today, I want to talk about economic refugees. Because we, as Black people, were brought here to this country against our own volition. We've never known what it is to be a refugee in this country. A lot of people come to America seeking asylum from other countries, war-torn countries, countries that are suffering under poverty or political um, occupations. Here in America, even though we are occupied, we've never necessarily seen our country as a threat. That's why many of us don't even have passports have never traveled internationally, which hinders our ability to really see America for what it is in a lot of ways. It's a whole different perspective to look at something from the inside out, but I'm noticing a very interesting phenomenon that's happening, and I'm not sure Black people are really paying attention to it. As my <laughs> co-host tonight Rashawn at Critically Drinking said, when white people get a cold, black people get the flu. So we've always been struggling in this country, whether it be, you know, the 70s where you saw a lot of gas embargoes and all types of things. We've just managed to always survive struggles. So I think we've internalized it to the point that we don't even see a struggle as a struggle anymore. But the eviction numbers have come out and evictions are up particularly, especially for Black women, 80% um, over 2019 when the pandemic started, of course, because, you know, we had a lot of moratorium on rent. People came right back in and put people out of homes. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, people got stimulus during that. People got three stimulus payments. That was not enough to keep your rent current. And yes, a lot of Black people squandered, <laughs> splurged with their stimulus. But the stimulus is what they call a surplus. It was given to people not out of welfare. Okay. The people who needed it the most got it. And most of those people were white. So I'm going to need black people to stop indicting other black people on how they spent their stimulus because if you understand how much welfare this government gives out to capitalists, you'd probably be mad. You'd probably be at the doorstep of your uh, officials and government right now asking for your money back if you knew where most of it was really going. So to indict the least of, the, of these as being the ones that are wasteful, it's just weird, to be quite honest. I find it super strange that people are upset at the people who got, I mean, fifteen, twelve hundred dollars in stimulus and have totally forgotten about the 2008 mortgage crisis when their government went to bail out banks who had sold people subprime mortgages. That's how they got in this situation in the first place was mismanaging 
funds because all loans is money that's borrowed by banks from the Federal Reserve. Hmm. So it was nothing but the government paying back their own money to themselves that they had loaned out. But my point is, even after those people mismanaged the money and got bailed out, they took that money and went and bought yachts with it. Okay, so do not get mad at poor black people that you see get their stimulus and then go and get a big screen TV with it. It's basically no different than capitalist behavior. And that's the problem is that you see the issues of the master class being mirrored in the slave class. Can you tell that slavery was a choice? And this is. That mirroring of the behavior of the master class is the very equivalent of slavery because we don't see it in other cultures, especially people who have nationality, culture, and ethnicity outside of the United States. If they are not ethnically American, they don't have those same issues. We have people come over here from India, from Pakistan, from these other countries, and they will sponsor other people from those countries to come here live communally together in a house, have jobs, save money, go out and buy cars, four and five of them at one time, houses, two and three of them at one time. Asians, everybody gets this. The white problems are the black problems. And the black problems, if you really look at them, violence, um, colonialism, patriarchy, they completely mirror the issues that are in white society. So I feel like people need to stop looking at black people through the lens that they look at them through. Because when you really look at the white supremacist power structure, we're almost on an autopilot running that same program, that same game for decades now, centuries now. And don't get me wrong, yes, Black people need to have autonomy. We need to be responsible for our own actions and behaviors. However, fixing something has to start by getting to the root of it. I would know. <laughs> I would know. One of the hardest things when you have been married to a narcissist is getting to the truth. Those people spend so much time blame shifting, avoidance triangulation that really actually getting to the root of what the issue and the problem is, is steeped in so much confusion that that's what really makes it hard for people who are in that type of cycle to leave. You know, when they sit back and they think over it, they can't really find and see the narcissist as the culprit. So you think to yourself, well, if I just work on me, you know, I can still coexist in this system and the system will improve because I myself have improved. I am part of the problem. Therefore, I am the solution. And because I am the solution to the problem, at least in part, I can make things better. But what you don't understand is you're dealing with someone who's oppositionally defiant. Every time you move, look, when you move, I move just like that. When you move, I move just like that. When I move, you move just like that. Every time you move, they move. Every time you reach the goal, they move the goalpost. And that's what it is to be black in America, which brings me to why we're here. We as black people have become economic refugees in this country without even noticing it. I was watching a little thing on something where they were talking about tiny houses and tiny house communities. And then they were talking in California about how they're using tiny house communities to combat homelessness. And they had built this little community running alongside of a um, railroad track, um, which is literally the, where the term other side of the tracks came from. But they had this little village of tiny homes and they had a drone showing an aerial shot of it. And I promise you, this could have been Rwanda. <laughs> this could have been Somalia. <laughs> this little tiny house community, it looked like a third world country and it dawned on me. 
it dawned on me where we're headed. More and more and more black people. And the saddest part about it is because we can't live with family, we can't make our relationship dynamics work. You'll see groups of women, roommates with each other, maybe a three bedroom house and they all live together. You'll see men that would rather room with each other, farting and toe jam and crust and stuff, than to live with a woman and some children. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to see what I like to call the one bedroom bandits. You meet these men who have multiple children, but they live in high rise luxury apartment complexes and studio apartments. One bedroom apartments. I'm like, how many kids do you have? Oh, I got three children. And you're looking around this 800 square foot apartment like, okay, so you don't even have a plan to include these people in your life. We're downsizing so many elements of our lives. We're allowing even this dream to be bought back away from us. I'm increasingly seeing more and more people that are working two jobs, two jobs and Ubering, you know, two jobs and not DoorDash. What's the other one? Instacart. I don't actually even know what that is. But you are literally getting to a place where one income, sometimes two income, is not enough to meet the basic requirements for life. And so many people complained about, you know, people getting a stimulus. It's weird because it was a lot of black people, especially the ones who couldn't qualify for it because they were doing okay. They will get upset at something that should be the right of a person who is a citizen in that country. Because we are so Americanized, we don't recognize that universal health care is the standard practice for most developed first world countries. Most developed first world, even some second world countries, pay for the education of their citizens because they know that those citizens are part of their workforce. It's like a training program to be able to make sure that your next generation of employees will be educated. It's a basic right to life. We have shortfalls when it comes to doctors, nurses. We bring them from other countries because most people in this country can't afford that level of education. They can't afford the seven years away from the workforce to be able to invest in educating themselves. I work in an industry where I see a lot of people who come from Middle Eastern countries and they come on student visas. And while they're here, they get stipend from their government. This is outside of student grants and any of that stuff. Just money because they're in this country going to school. But for some odd reason, we think for America to forgive student loan debt on the people who work and pay taxes and buy property and pay taxes in the country where they were educated should somehow also be paying back the debt of being educated so they can work and pay taxes and buy property in said country. It is a weird hamster wheel cycle that we are on here in America, and people have become so cognitively dissonant that they justify it. You know, if you just work hard enough, you can be like, you are not going to hourly wage your way up to the 1% in this country. You're not going to hourly wage your way into a living wage. It's just not set up that way. Capitalism would completely fail if every person was paid a living wage. We wouldn't have celebrities that are absorbently rich, that have more money than any one person should ever have, but can spend can comfortably spend in one lifetime. And we allow them to hold on to that type of wealth at the expense of poor people. And then complain about welfare. And then complain about stimulus. And then complain 
about the victims of the system getting assistance from the system. Anyway. So a lot of people that come to this country from like Mexico, countries like that, are economic refugees. They were unable to live where they were. Some of them are political refugees, don't get me wrong. I'm talking about the economic ones. I'm talking about people like me who lived in cities, but then corporations came out and bought the places where people lived and raised the prices on the people who lived there. So those people moved to the suburbs. You know, you used to move to the suburbs because you wanted to be away from black people because they were all living in the inner city. But then once the property values went down and people could come in and capitalize and gentrify those areas and push those same black people who had been relegated to the inner cities out. Now you can barely afford to live in the suburbs. And now we have lots of people who are economic refugees moving to cities with lower cost of living. That was my reason for choosing where I would move to. North Carolina state income tax is about to is about to ruin my quality of life. So the states like Texas that are seeing a large influx in immigration, people moving out to Texas because they have no state income tax. You know, people are finding ways to nickel and dime their way into the best economic situation as possible and we're still even after being relegated to 800 square feet, <laughs> living like inmates, some of us, being roomers, boarders, still just plugging, pick, 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 plugging away, still being willing to be cogs in a wheel. I just work harder. I'm just going to put in more hours driving Uber. I'm just going to, you know, um, start doing some DoorDash. They got you where you can't even enjoy the quality of your life. Most of us pay thousands and thousands of dollars in rent or mortgage in homes that we spend less than one third of our life and times in. We go there to sleep and occasionally watch Netflix. Most of our quality of life is being spent on jobs at work, we have bought into a system that has made us slaves. I mean, lots of systems, social media, the fallacy of the American dream has become a nightmare. And it's time for us as black people to wake up and start to practice the same group economics that work so well for other cultures, nationalities, and ethnicities of people. I'm going to get into this in another episode, but I had a knockdown drag out fight. I brought it up a couple times with some Jamaicans because they identify so heavily with being Jamaicans that despite the fact that their skin was darker than mine, they refused to be black and they refused to be black because there is no power in blackness. There is no politics in blackness. And because there's no black political agenda, there are no black economics. We cannot build infrastructure without a black agenda. We can't have black power. We can't put black women and children on jobs in communities where they're safe and able to pursue the same happiness that's guaranteed to us in this constitution. Because we refuse to do what we've seen every other group of people who holds on to power do. We just work as a group. It's been the consistent, continuous, ongoing theme of particularly black men that I speak to that we will get there through individual pursuits. That the black community, black unity, black consciousness is dead. They're right. But what they have to understand is that we die with it. I appreciate those of us that I see who are willing to create community by any means necessary. Those of us that are getting together to 
you know, make sure that our bills are taken care of. But it's the most basic level of survival. We have to thrive. We have to begin to have community food sources, community places where we hold money together, banks. We have to have an educational system where we can begin to raise up conscious-minded youths that are not being indoctrinated, infected with their education system from a young age. We have to have a social consciousness when it comes to the other Black people that are around us. Because if not, they're going to relegate us back to these ghettos and they're going to be crime-laden, poverty-stricken areas of the city. And that's the first level of building ghettos. That was the first level of Nazi Germany becoming a superpower was getting people who were not German people I mean, those Jews were German, but because they could culturally discriminate against these people, they could relegate them to one area of the city, one area of the towns. It's happening. And we can look at those few intermittent Black people that are doing well and think it's not going to affect all of us, but they are capitalists. They are excused from the racial politics of everyone else that's in the middle class, the working poor class, or living in poverty. There's more of us than there are of them, and we have to start thinking of it that way. There's more brown people in this country than there are non-brown people. We've got to reach across the aisle to Hispanics and other people who are suffering under economic refugee status in this country and band together and begin to buy large plots of uninhabited land. We've got to make that generational wealth. We've got to make that sovereignty, that freedom, that ability to have what we need when we need it be more important a little bit of delayed gratification over have it, have being in our bag, flexing in this lifetime. Rashawn came on my channel tonight and said something that I found to be very insightful. He said it may not happen in our lifetime. And so we're going to have to teach the next generation delayed gratification because a lot of Hispanic, I consider them to be my brothers and sisters, even though phew, these racial dynamics hurt them, honestly more than it helps them, whether they can see that or not. But a lot of them die in the desert coming over to this country to try to strive for just a little bit of what we take for granted every day. But we soon are going to join them in the struggle if we do not learn from the successes that we see in this country right now. Because the successes that we see in this country are not capitalists. I'm watching a lot of white people. They don't even care if they married. They don't care about that. They live together. They build wealth. They worry about whether they can make it in a marriage later. And I'm not a proponent of that. I'm just saying that the only people who still arguing back and forth over desirability politics, over a bunch of things that divide their community is us, only just us. So if we can have that in common, let's go ahead and be some joint tenants in common and get some property, get some businesses about ourselves. If you see what I see and you feel as I feel. But if you see what I see, if you feel as I feel, and if you would seek as I seek. Go ahead and drop that fire headphones emoji in the comments. Let me know what your ideas are. I always say that truth is a collective consciousness. Even God himself exists in relationship to himself. God is in three persons. If you believe in Jesus at all, you know that what I'm saying is the truth. So if he confers with himself about what he's creating, if he says, hey, let us confer together and make man in our image, then we as black people can't think that we're ready 
as the actual consciousness and express image of God in the earth to go lone wolf, rogue style, and do this by ourselves. It's time for us to come together right now over me. See you in the next one. You can clock out now. You're dismissed. Section leaders, what is our concept? One band, one sound. One band, one sound.